Bayesian methods, what are they? Well, I guess the answer is, in a way, my life is all about Bayesian methods. You might think that's pretty dark, but it's true. Did maths, 1970, stats course in the second year, good old maths stats courses, no data, no idea of analysing or inferring anything, just large numbers of matrices, and a belief that Annabelle was a Russian mathematician. Um, that's the only joke. <laughs> the next year, though, for some reason, I stuck with stats and did a course on Bayesian stats. And it changed, inverted commas, my life. Bayesian statistics, as we're going to <clears throat> develop during the 50s and 60s and 70s, but it really didn't come of age to the 90s. So going in in the 70s, I was sort of one of the early guys. It was introduced to me by Adrian Smith. He's the guy that's deciding about impact measures for the universities at the moment. Um, he's been knighted. Um, Mike Dempster, who's done a lot of work on financial economics apart from Bayesian stats, but most of all a book by Maury de Groot. Um, nobody reading it these days will realise quite what it was like, but it changed everybody's thinking in the 70s because it actually laid out the whole of statistics and decision theory in a complete framework that at least you could understand if you were a mathematician and you could take out to other people by speaking English occasionally. Okay? So I did that, I got my degree, and ended up applying Bayesian statistics to protein crystallography. That might not sound a, a great start to talk about methods at Manchester when you're um, dealing with people who are predominantly social scientists. But it, 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 it was one of the early applications in the sense that the other courses I was doing in my maths degree were about computing. I'd been trained as a Fortran programmer. And most people have been applying protein, sorry, Bayesian stats to pretty small problems. I, I was doing, well, they weren't large problems, linear regressions in modern language with about 21 variables except I had about 2,000 to do in half an hour's computer time. And the power of Bayesian statistics to deal with that was one of the things that got my thesis through and everything else, and it convinced a few other people. Um, it was one of the first biggish computing problems using Bayesian stats. 1979, there was a big conference in Valencia. Big, there were 79 of us. Um, it was reputed to be the largest gathering of Bayesian statisticians ever from across the world. So you can work out we were quite a small number of people. Okay? Four years later we had the second Valencia conference and it was nearly the end of Bayesian statistics because we went on an outing on a boat and nearly all of them drowned. Uh, I survived because I don't swim. The rest survived because fortunately my wife and a couple of other people swam and went in and got them out. Um, but it was really quite nearly the end of Bayesian stats. Since then, every three or four years, there's been a Valencia conference. I've been to them all. The last one was in 2010, and it was actually the last one. Because there's been a decision that you don't need them anymore. From 79 people in 1979 to 2010, where there were several hundred, and it was a small proportion of the people in the world rather than the majority of people in the world doing Bayesian stats. Bayesian stats has gone from a very small proportion of statistics as is practiced across all disciplines to 50, 60, 70% of the statistics as practiced. Amazingly, there are two, well, medicine was late in, medical statistics was late in, it was happening more in environmental statistics, physical sciences and that sort of area. And social sciences is still not very Bayesian, to say the least. But if you go into the sciences and the um, medicine, you'll find a lot more about Bayesian stats than you will find in um, social statistics texts. I've actually spent more time working on decision analysis rather than statistical analysis, but as I say, as you'll see, it's exactly the same philosophy. And, and that's the thing. The Bayesian approach is a philosophy. It's not so much a method. 
the method, as you'll see, is very, very simple. But it's how you interpret that method that seems to make the difference. Because Bayesians, or the Bayesian view of statistical inference and scientific inference, isn't that things are objective, rather they're subjective. You go in and you model judgments and you explore the implications of variation in judgments. So you use probabilities to represent your belief in the value of a parameter, the value of a quantity, how likely you think the quantity is to be here or here, and then you update that belief with data, and you explore how your belief changes, and you explore what your belief would be if you had different starting points. And gradually that brings in a model of an idealised, consistent scientist. A scientist who can look at data and adjust his judgments before the event, before he sees the data, to what he believes after he sees the data. And it's all idealised, and, and you explore that scientist, and you begin to see what a group of people would do. Because first of all, you focus on the individual scientist, and then you vary that scientist's start beliefs to see what consensus might be. So you look at how a number of scientists looking at the same data, where they would end up. If they end up in the same place, the data is strong and outweighs initial dis um, disagreements. If the answers you get depend very much on where you start from, then the data is not strong enough to bring about consensus. And so, Bayesian statistics, you're exploring knowledge, you're exploring understanding by looking for consensus rather than some objective proof. And that's the key to what goes on in, in the Bayesian analysis. It's about exploring consensus as much as anything else. It's a philosophy, so Gillian asked me to decide which one of the headings I should come under that was on methods at Manchester, and I asked for all of them. I don't know where she's put me, I haven't looked, but um, it really is difficult to say that you can have Bayesian survey related methods, but not Bayesian quality assessment. You can have Bayesian anything. It's, a, it's an approach. And that's what I'm going to try and get across as I calm down over the next half hour. It all comes from a guy called Thomas Bayes. He was a reverend. He lived to 1761, um, and he'd been working on probability theory then, which was as much about gambling as it was about anything else, because in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, mathematicians lived by earning their living by supporting gamblers. It's the only way you could get patrons. I mean, if you did great music, they were, you could easily pick up a patron, but somebody who did algebra, nah. Um, but probability and helping out in gambling did. He wasn't so much interested in gambling, but he was interested in the mass of probability. He was a member of the Royal Society, but he died before he communicated his results. And a guy called Richard Price published Bayes' work posthumously in 1763. And essentially, it's something called Bayes' theorem, or maybe you've heard of it, inverse probability. And it's very simple. It's the only, well, there are two theorems in, in the whole of the subject area. Here's one of them. Looks horrible. Let, let's start dealing by changing it into language. It says, what you believe in advance about something times how likely the data is you get gives you what you should believe afterwards. Let, let's take it a bit further. This sign is proportional to, I don't know if any of you remember it from O-level maths in the old day. Um, but what it means is, one of the advantages that we have in Bayesian approaches is we know probability adds up to one. You know, we all know that. But it actually means that when you're doing calculations, don't to worry too much about constants, because at the end you can renormalize everything to make them add up to one. And that proportionality sign just says, oh, forget about some of the nasty algebra, it's going to add up to one in the end, you can get rid of it at the end. So we can get rid of some of the things that would make this look even more hideous, like integral signs and everything else. This bit, in statistics, you're normally looking for some parameters. And like all good statisticians, parameters come in Greek letters, so we've got to keep it there. 
and P of theta represents a scientist's view of what he or she thinks theta would be before he or she has seen any more data. It might include what they believe on data up to now, but it's before they've seen any more data, it's where they think theta is going to be. The likelihood says, well, we're actually going to get some data, and that's going to depend on this thing, theta. If we knew theta, what do we think x would be? Where do we think the data would be if we knew theta? And that's actually the likelihood function you hear of in maximum likelihood methods, in all of other bits of statistics. But it, it's just how likely the data is given a particular set of parameters. So the next one is the posterior probability. It's what you believe, having seen the data, how it's adjusted your prior beliefs in theta to give you what you believe afterwards, synthesizing your prior judgment with what the data is telling you. And it's all written in language, it's a bit of algebra up there and everything else, but the great thing about us in 2011, as opposed to me in 1972, is as soon as you see nasty algebra, you lean across the computer and it does everything in the background for you. In my day, I had to do the algebra. So I used to see lots of subscripts and everything else around. But let's have a look at what, what the computers say. And let's take a very, very simple example. Supposing I have got a coin that I know is very biased. But I don't know how it's biased. I don't know if it's biased to heads or tails or whatever. I just know that its probability of falling heads could be anything between 0 and 1. And I'm going to toss it 12 times. And in that experiment, when I toss it 12 times, I happen to get 9 heads. Well, if you do some simple um, assumptions on the way through to make probability distributions calculate easily and a few other things, Beforehand, I didn't know where theta was, what the parameter was, so I'm going to say it could be anywhere between 0 and 1. I'm going to put equal weight, if you like, on every possible value of theta. So that's a flat prior. It means I don't know between 0 and 1. I'll come back to that in a minute. After I obtain nine heads, well, it's a tossing a coin. It's a binomial distribution for those who know good probabilities. But you can write down what the likelihood function is. You multiply the two together. Renormalize so everything integrates or adds up to one, and you get that curve. And that's what I believe, having seen nine heads. It's moved so the probability of the heads is much more likely to be near a one than it is to be near a null, which is what you'd expect. It's accumulated sort of near nine, but not completely at nine because, I'm um, sorry, not, not nine out of not. 9 out of 12 would be 75%. It's not exactly at 75%, but it's close, and it's sort of around there, which feels right. Okay. And, and that's typically what, well, that's all Bayesian is. I mean, if you want to estimate, you can just, if you want to say, what's the estimate of this parameter? Well, you could take the highest point at the moment. You could take the medium where it's 50% more, 50% less, and take the mean of the difference. You get slightly different numbers, but they're all in the sort of area you'd expect of about 70.75. Okay. Um, and you can see what an estimate is. If you want a confidence interval, that's easy. Confidence intervals for Bayesians are doddle. You want a confidence interval is so that the probability that a parameter lies between these values is 95%. So I just look for the highest 95% area, for instance. And the probability that theta lies between there and there is 95%. <coughs> and it looks like the obvious one to take. It's intuitive and everything else. If I want to test the hypothesis that, let's say, theta is greater than 6 out of 10, 6% six, you know, 6 chance of heads, there's the line point six. Probability it's greater than 0.6 is that probability, the area under that curve. So it sort of gives you a p-value immediately without you wondering what on earth this f-test was or of. You know, it gets you there without pain. But actually, why do any of those? If you look at what most statisticians do when they're estimating, they're producing confidence intervals or their 
um, testing hypotheses. They're actually helping scientists to get hold of a number, or something about a number. And that scientist is then going to go on with that number and put it into some other calculation. Well, if instead of giving them a single number, you give them that distribution, you can do things called Monte Carlo, or you can do all the calculations that the scientist needs to do based on the randomness inherent in that distribution. So you take out an approximation step. And actually, if you want to convey information, that is much more visual than an estimate or property principle or anything else. People can see what it is. So if you're talking with decision makers, which is where I play, showing them that is a hell of a lot more interesting than showing them that. You know, turn the p-values 0.7 something like that. So Bayesians, one of the problems, well, one of the things that happened early on is we stopped doing hypotheses tests, we stopped doing estimation, we stopped doing confidence intervals quite as much. We just started reporting posteriors, which led to the interesting comment that was out there during the 80s at Best State, Bayesians talk through their posteriors. Yeah, I said I'd give one joke, there's about three more to come, I love them. Um, I said I do decision analysis. Well, actually, decision analysis and inference are the same. Inference is learning from data. Decision analysis is helping people make decisions in the light of what they've learned from data. <clears throat> so the two things sort of naturally come together. And for decision analysis, I sort of separate, or Bayesian separate science from values. Science is what's likely to happen what you know about the world, values is how much you care about it. You model the science with uncertainty and probability distribution, Bayes' distribution updates it with data. The nice thing about Bayes' theorem also is you get a posterior, you get some more data, that posterior becomes your prior for the next world watch of data. So you just cycle on. So I can continuously and sequentially taking data. Do you remember I said one of the things I did in my PhD was solve 2021 linear regressions on computers in 1970 in half an hour. The reason I could do that is that I did it by this. I reduced 21 by 21 problems down to one by one problems and took them in 21 times. And that meant instead of having to invert 21 by 21 matrices, which is what goes on in linear regression, you only invert one by one matrices, which is a number. You can do it in your head. And the calculations became fast. There's one or two criteria which I'll get to in a minute. So Bayes allow you to deal with problems sequentially. And, and sequential thinking is sort of fundamental within Bayes because you're moving from this state of belief through your data to the next state of belief through your data to your next stage of belief. And it sort of models not just how a rational scientist deals with one experiment but how he learns or she learns through life. Sorry. The other side of things is that you're also thinking about how much things matter to you. So you have a theory about modelling values which is called utility theory. And you combine your uncertainty with probabilities through your feelings about value through utilities by something called the expected utility theory. Economists know this, there's rational expectations, there's a few other of them in. But the nice thing is, again, you get to one theorem. In fact, those are the only two bits of mathematics I learned in my Bayesian stats course. And they're the only two bits I've used ever since. Um, if you're a classical statistician, you were learning maximum likelihood estimator, minimum variance, unbiased estimator, chi-squared test. Everything you did was ad hoc. You had to learn new theorems and everything else, asymptotics and what have you. This, there are two guiding principles that everything follows. Well, everything provided you can do that horrible thing there, which is an integral or a big sum, and some of these multiplications and find that constant. And that's where the problem is. When I was young, going back to the 1970s, the only way you could do the Bayesian calculations was by something called conjugate families of distributions, which essentially means you were stuck with the normal distribution, the chi-square distribution, and a few other things. Okay? 
life, for that matter, was tied into statistics, but I didn't quite know what I meant. But you were tied into simple distributions because you could do the arithmetic. Or, and this is where I got my strength from in my PhD, or the, the power. Kalman filters, they came in during the 60s to help you do sequential things in control theory in engineering. And we realized at the beginning of the 70s, they would do your Bayesian calculations um, very efficiently on much more complex things. But still not as complex as you wanted. Because if you're dealing with social science problems, and a lot of environmental problems. You don't just have 21 parameters, you have 600. The figures like that lying around, you have huge data sets. And even these things wouldn't get you through. So you had to start doing numerical integration. Numerical integration over um, large data sets is just not fun. So as computers got more powerful during the 80s, things got a bit better and Bayesians did a bit more. But then, round about 1990, that guy Adrian Smith I mentioned earlier, the one who comes up with Impact Factory, um, he came up with something called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Oh, it was called Gibbs sampling in those days. And he didn't really come up with it. He read a physics book about uncertainty written, I think, in the 30s, but I may be wrong, and realised the method. And what Markov Chain Monte Carlo does is it basically says that if you take any reasonable probability distribution, which may not even have a name, it may just be an empirical name, as much as it's required, and any reasonable likelihood function that comes from any reasonable probability distribution, and you apply Bayes' theorem, so you won't get to the posterior, Markov chain will calculate you an approximation by repeated sampling, if you like. It randomizes and does repeated sampling. It doesn't work in every occasion, but it works now on the majority of problems, the vast majority, where you have very complex structures, your regression equations and your transformation of variables may be horrible and everything else. But Markov chain Monte Carlo on modern computing will do all the calculations you want far faster than anything else. Um, WinBugs is the standard program for doing it. And there's where you get it from, and I'll mention it again at the end. That's a lovely program, because not only does it do your calculations for you, it's also a word processor like Mathematica. So you can write your paper and do the calculations within the word processor that's doing your paper. Um, and it draws the diagrams within the paper and everything else for you. So that's a brief history of what... Answer what are Bayesian methods, I may have done the job, Andrew, I don't know. But on a technical sense, I've been through them at a very high level. It's simply got two theorems. One I've concentrated on is Bayes' theorem. The other is much more if you're interested in decision making. We can talk about that afterwards. Um, subjective and subjective utility theorem. But Bayes' theorem is your one theorem. It tells you how you model the link at the start with the prior distribution. You multiply it by the likelihood, and that's proportional to what you believe afterwards. Simple. The catch is, it's explicitly subjective. What this says is, when you go into science, a science lab, you, or when you go into a statistical analysis, you should put the scientist into the analysis as well. It's explicitly putting <coughs> the person making the inference into the model alongside the objective world. And certainly during the 50s, 60s and 70s, that wasn't thought to be a good idea. And if you take many of the social science research methodology courses offered to our PhD students, you also find it's not a good idea. <coughs> the sciences, they're not so sure about that anymore. Um, they're much more willing to be subjective, which is an interesting comment, um, given scientists are meant to be the objective ones. But anyway, there's a lot of controversy. It was really bitter. There's a lovely quote from 68. Morris Kendall, who's one of the, well, if you've read the Advanced Theory of Statistics Encyclopedia, he wrote it. You know, he's one of the greats of stats. And he wasn't entirely joking when he said he wished all Bayesians would publish posthumously like Bayes himself had. <laughs> 
I came to Manchester in 76. I won't say who said this to me, but I went into the econometrics department then, which really was an office. And I went it's on the fifth floor of Dover Street in those days and introduced myself and everything else. It was really nice until they discovered I was a baby. Well, apart from the fact we didn't talk for another two years, they suggested it would be quicker for me to get out via the window than via the door. Um, and I, it sounds like a joke, and it, it almost was, but it was literal. The fights and the controversies in those days were substantial. And I guess they were exciting times, particularly as we came out pretty much the winners once we got NCMC. But it did bring out to the fore a discussion between subjectivity and objectivity. Most of the time that was vicious. Gradually over the years it softened and now we're having that debate in much more reasonable terms. But it raises the question of should a scientist be modelled in the statistical analysis? Because if you think about all your stats analyses, you have a likelihood function or you have a distribution that describes the experiment, but you don't ever have the experimenter in the model. And the Bayesian puts them centrally in there. On the grounds that the model, the experimenter's prior beliefs will have shaped the experiment. You don't just do an experiment at random. You do an experiment based on what you know and you design it to fit what you know to test points or learn about the bits you don't know. So, in fact, the experiment had been designed subjectively, even though you've done it to analyze it objectively in the whole stack. But the Bayesian says, let's put him in. Let's see what he or she is saying and how it changes them. So, this isn't my joke. Um, and it's not really a joke, it's actually serious. Supposing you think of three experiments. First one's tea tasting. Now this was actually set by Leonard, of uh, uh, a story was originally told by Savage, um, Leo Savage. He was one of the great fathers of Bayesian stats. He wrote a, one of the fundamental books about 1954. Um, and in about 19, late 1960s, he came up with this example, or three examples. And in those days, tea ladies had tea trolleys as they came down a corridor. Some of us, our generation, we're not that old. But, but I certainly remember it. You didn't have a coffee bar in an office block, you had a tea lady. And she used to make the tea and it came out big teapots and everything else. We well, meet this tea lady and she says she can always tell whether you put milk in the cup and then the tea, or tea in the cup and then the milk, just by tasting it. Okay? She can tell whether it's milk first or tea first, just by the taste. Easy, yeah? So she gives you 10 cups. You do randomly allocate milk first or tea first, as a good statistician would. You make cups of tea, she tastes it. 10 out of 10, she's exactly right. Okay? Absolutely right, 10 out of 10 times. Then over lunch, you meet the professor of music. He specialises in Brahms, you know that, and he tells you that he can work out the particular piece of music that Brahms wrote simply by listening to the first three notes. So you whip out your, in those days, LPs, you play in ten pieces of music, just the first three notes, ten out of ten, he gets it exactly right. That night you're telling your mate about it in the pub, and next to you suddenly appears a slobbering drunk, hardly able to stand up, hiccuping like mad, and he tells you that take any coin and toss it, and he can tell you whether it's right, 10 out of 10, you know, every time, heads or tails, he'll get it exactly right. Any coin you take, any mate, go around the pub, find a coin, toss it 10 times, he'll get it right. So you take the coin, you toss it 10 times, exactly right, 10 out of 10. Okay, so in all cases, the data is 10 out of 10. If you're a good statistician, you write down a hypothesis, a null hypothesis. A null hypothesis is the expert, be it a tea lady, a Brahms expert, or a drunk, is right no more than by, would be expected by chance. The alternative is better than chance. 
In every case, you've got a half to the tenth, which is one over a thousand and twenty-four, isn't it? Which is well below 0 0.01, so it's not just, it's highly significant error. Everybody knows, in all these cases, things are better than my chart. Do you believe it? No, at least one person shaking their head. Same evidence, same conclusion. If you do a Bayesian one, you start off with different prior knowledge. Because for the tea lady, I really don't know. I really don't know why they put milk in first, or, you know, if they can tell or not. Do you know why you put milk into the cup first in England, but tea into the cup first in Ireland? We invented bone china first. If you put milk into bone china, you create lower temperature and it doesn't snap. The, the Irish never got to bone china, so they had old earthenware mugs. And that's not quite as jokey as it sounds. It's a historical thing, I gather, having been down around Stoke and the Potteries. So you put in a flat part, just like we did. There's your likelihood. You multiply them together. You can't actually see the difference because this is consonant. So there's your posterior distribution. It's accumulating up here now, and it's saying that the tea lady is probably quite smart. Okay? She's a pretty good investor. You're beginning to believe it. Okay? If, if somebody who's a professor of music tells me they can recognise music, I'm not going to be desperately surprised. So my prior for... Um, him is the red line. And it's accumulating much more probability on him being likely to be able to tell when it's music. Give you some barn notes, though. There's the likelihood function multiplied together, and I've become even more confident that he can do it. So that's not surprising. That fits with the story. With the drunk, there's no way that 10 out of 10 tosses is going to convince me that a drunk is actually going to be in touch with the, with the statistics of the universe to predict pure chance. So I start off fairly convinced that it's 50-50, and I don't move much. The evidence just doesn't outweigh my prior. And that example, not only to me, tells me that there is a good reason for putting the scientist's knowledge in, but it also begins to say you can see how the same evidence can have different effects on different people. Coming back to that prior, different priors lead to different conclusions. That was always the argument it was subjective, it's not scientific, but you can get round that. In the early days, and actually still today, because there's a whole theory of non-informative priors still going around, what a lot of people tried to do was define complete ignorance and say that for an objective scientific analysis, you shouldn't put the scientist in who's actually doing the experiment. You should put in a completely ignorant scientist and see what somebody who was completely ignorant would learn from that experiment. And that would give you the objective evidence that came out of the data. The catch is, well, let the data speak for themselves. The catch is, it really is difficult to be completely ignorant. You might think it's easy, and you can think of lots of people you would call completely ignorant. They're not. Defining ignorance is very difficult. Start when you're going to define theta. Well, that means you've got some understanding to know what theta is and that what model it goes in and what you measure. But you probably know that theta is either positive or it's between 0 and a million or something like that. You've got some bounds on theta almost as soon as you've written it down because it's got to be that if it's going to fit with your knowledge of the universe. It really is very difficult to write down complete ignorance. Then you start worrying about what happens if I transform the data. If you look at a, a distribution that's flat on one parameter and you transform that parameter, the distribution is, is no longer flat. And so ignorance <laughs> gets transformed into knowledge. And just by transforming the <clears throat> the scale on which you measure things. There's lots of problems in there. And I think one of the issues that Bayesians had during the um, 50s, 60s and 70s was they tried to answer the question, how do we be objective, by coming up with objective ignorance. And it's, it's, you can 
find papers on it, you could go from journals like um, any of the stats journals through to the philosophy of mind and things like that. And there's lots of discussion of how to do it, and it comes to no helpful conclusions. Then there's a group of people, who I was one of and still am to a certain extent, who said, well, actually, I don't want to be a human. I'm supposed to be a scientist. I'm supposed to know things about the universe. What I want to do is know how my beliefs change in the light of data, not throw away my starting beliefs. So you end up developing priors that capture knowledge, and you've got a whole structures, procedures for eliciting, working with scientists to capture what they know. And then you get to the point where computing is cheap, and that makes a big difference, because computing's got so much more powerful over my lifetime that you've moved from a position of only being able to deal with simple distributions to being able to deal with very complex distributions complex data structures and everything else. And now, you can do it lots of times too. So you can repeat the analyses with lots of different priors. In the early days, if it's going to take you three days to do the calculations with one prior, you ain't going to do it with different ones. So what you can do is you can do the analysis with lots of different priors. Sometimes you find that as you vary the prior, the distribution does that, and you can't see any difference very little difference. So you feel the data is strong, and therefore, whatever people believe to start with, as long as it's in the ballpark of sanity, um, then they're going to end up with the same conclusion. So you've got a consensus answer. Sometimes you find that as you change your prior, it jumps, it jumps around all over the place effectively. So you learn that the data you've got isn't strong enough to overcome the current controversy. And you really have to either go and get more data or whatever, but you ain't going to decide the issue just on what you saw at the moment. So you can do that. In fact, once you start talking about sensitivity analysis, you realise that not only is the prior a model, idealised model of one scientist's belief, <clears throat> it's good to look at several scientists' beliefs and see how that changes. The likelihoods are pretty... Um, just one model of how the data might be generated, and there could be lots of those, so you can do sensitivity analysis on that. You could do sensitivity analysis on the underlying model, because the underlying model, the bit that tells you how theta fits into the universe, that may have one conception of the universe, you can have other models that have other conceptions of the universe. And you can have very different models and you can compare them, because you can do the calculations in the same way. So model comparison is very strong in Bayesian theory as well. You can check out completely different sets of assumptions in the physical world as well as in your belief world, your priors and your likelihood. And that, apart from the last two or three slides, which is where you can find out the real stuff, is all I really wanted to say. It seems to me that with a Bayesian philosophy, life becomes easier. The hard bit is been doing the calculations and now computing has fortunately got us there. Bux is freely available software. It does a huge amount of stuff for you. Absolutely, it's not easy to understand. It gives people way into it and everything else. The first, the, the standard reference to it is um, David Spiegelhalter, who led the project, Nicky Best. Nicky's talking on Bux in two weeks' time, three weeks' time. <coughs> so you're going to get it from. Um, I won't say the horse's mouth because Nikki is a very attractive lady, um, but she will tell you all about it and everything else, and she will lead you through it, and you'll find out that Wim Box is really powerful and does a lot. You won't get to use it without doing a lot of pain of learning to use it, like you do with any big package. But you'll always be guided by the fact that you need a prior, you need a likelihood, and you'll find people who can steer you the right. And you can download it for free from there. There's WinBugs, which works under Windows. There's OpenBugs, which is a system that links with something called R. Anybody ever heard of R? Well, a few of you. Well, R, for the rest of you, is a completely free statistical package that does just about everything, as long as you think in the unintelligible way of a mathematician and write down unintelligible formula. But if you want to develop statistical packages, R is a free way of doing it, if you like. And 
by putting wind bucks into R, it means you can link it with all sorts of other things. It's very powerful. So we have the software. It's free. There's a big project out there that keeps on building it. There are example data sets, particularly in medicine, because David comes out of medicine, medical stats. Nikki, I think, is about starting medical stats. We'll move on to geographical stats and a few other things. There's a big society in it. 79 of us, we only got together in Valencia in 79. You know, 79 people in 79 squared or whatever it is. It wasn't worth having a society. There's now a huge society called the International Society for Vagrant Analysis. It runs big conferences around the world. It has a website. Angela and Gillian asked me to produce a website for this conference, this talk, which linked off to books, to software, to other things that you might look at. Well, I'm not going to repeat what they've done. If you go on there for free, you can find an awful lot of links to an awful lot of suggestions and so on. Guides for software, there's a regular newsletter. There's an open journal which is fun because under REF I think it's still not good enough for me publishing, but in the Bayesian world it's a four star plus journal. But it's free and you can get at it and you can see some things. And there are interesting papers if you go back. Just when did Bayesian analysis become Bayesian is one of the papers written by we'll come back to it. <laughs> but he's one of the one of the old stats people. He looked at the history of, of, of the philosophy of Bayesian stats in that you can also join the society, I think it's $35 at the moment. And the other thing you have to know is that every conference, of Bayesian conferences have more fun. We, because the subject is so easy and you've only got two theorems, you spend more time in the bar than most conferences. And there's a few references. That's an introductory textbook that sort of looks like any introductory stats textbook. But it, it's got too much maths in it to my mind, to most people, but you know, given that almost all stats books have got hot peppered with mathematics, this is no worse than those, and it's a, a good introduction. That one is just out. Um, it's big, it's solid, it looks frightening because it's covered in mathematics, but actually it links everything into wind bugs and R so that if you want to learn to do Bayesian analysis, it's linking you in to teach you how to do it with the software. Peter Condon's book also links with WinBugs, but it was written in 2001. It's a bit out of date in that sense, but it's very much in date for you in a sense because it goes a bit more near the social sciences than most Bayesian books. Well, I couldn't not put it up, could I? I wrote a book with David Reeves and so up on statistical decision theory, which looks at the decision bit as well as the stats bit. It's in the Encyclopedia of Statistics, the Kendall Stewart series, which is incredibly mathematical as a series. So I apologise for anybody who reads it. There is something in there that has an awful word, but mainly it's algebra. But it, it surveys the whole of the subject as it was then. Tony O'Hagan's book is one of the classics. Um, now with John Forrester from Southampton. Again, it tends to lead towards the sciences rather than social sciences, and again, it can be rather mathematical. And that is probably the classic book still, in terms of if you want the theory, it's all in there. That's the same Adrian Smith that we talked about earlier. Jose Bernardo is a lovely Spanish guy. He's just retired. He, he was at Valencia. And he set up the Valencia conferences. And it's worth knowing how he got the money for that. 1978 was, 77, 78 was when Franco went from China, um, from Spain, do you remember? Around about then. Major open elections were in 1978. Jose Bernardo had been a card-carrying socialist in the times when he was shot for being a card-carrying socialist in Spain. But... He survived. He was back over there and done his degree in London. He was working with the Socialist Party who were in the election. He did Bayesian forecasting of the election results. He was updating the results as they came in. Remember he said you could do it sequentially? Not only did the Socialists win, 
They had the pleasure of winning and predicting closer and closer to the final result as they went in there. And the populace thought, yeah, wonderful, this is fantastic. Not only are they socialists and not Franco, they can know the future. <laughs> and as a result of that, he was told he could have anything he wanted by the socialist government within reason. So he funded the conferences for the last 30 years. 